Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13, it's found on page 1507 in the Pew Bible. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. As I was preparing last Sunday's sermon, I found myself quite intrigued by the whole subject, and I realized that I was only scraping the surface of the depth that is involved when discussing the connection between Christ's healing of sickness and his ultimate healing of our sins. We talked last week about how the gospel of Jesus has to do with both, and we even see in this story, in, in just in the story of Jesus healing someone, how he brought that spiritual connection of eternal destiny involved in, in all of this. If we talk about one and exclude the other, you're, you're talking about a gospel that is incomplete. I'd like to follow up this morning on the same general theme, but to examine more closely and more specifically how Jesus viewed sickness and how he deals with the problem of sin almost identically the same way. And I don't mean to be repetitive, but I think it's important to examine this concept because of the prevalence of sickness in our lives. Now, there have always been sick people, but maybe it's because technology has increased and we are able to identify diseases more readily than ever before, but it just seems that there are more and more people who are struggling with illness and thus more and more questions about where all that fits in with our faith in the one that we believe can heal the sick. So in the passage that John read for us this morning, we get a sense of how prominent and vital that healing was to the earthly ministry of Jesus. We're told again and again that he went around healing people. And the word had spread about the power that he had so that the certain centurion believed that all Jesus had to do was say the word and his servant would be healed. Jesus once said that the reason that he came was so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. And I believe that this refers not only to the hereafter eternal life, but also to life here on earth. Jesus responds to suffering humanity, no matter what kind of suffering it might be, whether it's physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. Even if we have brought that suffering upon ourselves, Jesus came to offer relief, to offer abundant life. And so as we see how he brought relief to those who were suffering from illnesses or from disabilities or from mental torment, we can come to understand more about how he brings relief to the sting of sin in our lives. For example, one thing that we learned from Jesus' approach to sickness was his acknowledgement that disease and suffering were not a part of the right and natural order of things. Creation was not set up to include these things. God didn't make us so that we would get sick and suffer pain and die. These things came into the world because of sin. And as long as there is sin in the world, then these things will still be here. No matter how advanced technology gets, 
no matter how knowledgeable doctors get, there will still be diseases that plague us. And that's because of the fact that there is sin. Now, some diseases are a, dis a direct result of sin, but others can only be explained by the fact that there's sin in the world. In that regard, Jesus made it clear that a person's sickness is not necessarily due to his own sin. The story of Job makes that clear for one thing. Job was a righteous man, but still he was afflicted with illness. But also in, in John chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus said that uh, this particular man's blindness was not due to any particular sin, not his parents' sin or his own sin. So just because you have sinned doesn't mean that you're going to get sick. Or just because you're sick doesn't mean that you're being punished for some sin you've committed. You know, if that were how it works, then we would all be sick in bed today instead of being here at church. However, the reason that there is sickness in the world is because sin has destroyed the natural order of things. As long as there is sin, therefore, there will be sickness. The mission of Jesus Christ, therefore, is to restore the natural order of things, to bring us back to the place that God wants us to be and where he created us to be, to get rid of all those things that tear away at life, like sickness, like sin. Both sickness and sin lead to death. You know, if, sin, if sickness isn't cured, it's going to lead to your death. If sin isn't cured, it's going to lead to your death. Jesus came to conquer death and everything that is associated with it. And there is coming a day when Jesus completes his work, when, hallelujah, there will be no more sickness. That is because sin will have been healed. We were not made to be sick. We were not made to die. Once when Jesus healed a crippled woman, he was criticized, not because he healed someone, but because he did it on the Sabbath day. And Jesus answered that criticism by saying in Luke 13, 16, Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? That's what our religion is all about. It's about the healing that Jesus came to bring to us, physically and spiritually. Jesus came that we might have life, and have it more abundantly. He came to make things as they were supposed to be. So every time a person is healed from sickness, every time a soul is saved from sin, Christ has taken one more step to completing that process of restoring the right and natural order of things. Another thing that we see in Christ's healing of the sick is his total dependence on God's divine power. On several occasions after performing a miracle of healing, Jesus would say things like he did in John 5, 19. The son can do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the father doing. Or he would say, I can do nothing on my own initiative. I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Or I do not speak on my own initiative, but the father abiding in me does his work. In other words, Jesus' ability to heal was dependent entirely on his close walk and his communication with his heavenly father. Now, yes, Jesus was and is God in every understanding of our, of our, uh, of our senses. But when Jesus came to earth, the Bible tells us in Philippians 2.6 that even though being in very nature God, that he emptied himself of those divine prerogatives and he depended on the power of his relationship, his, his living prayer to God, for the victory that he would demonstrate over sickness and death. And so when Jesus prayed, he was put in touch with the source of all healing and life. And so it's important for us to know where that power came from, where that healing comes from, whether we're talking about healing from disease or, or healing from our sin. This is how we find salvation for our souls, by being in touch with the source of life, and entering into a relationship with God and depending totally on his power to save us. Jesus is the one who puts us in touch with God. He opened the way of communication with God so that our lives too can just be a living prayer to God. So I'm saying all this to say that the prayer changes things. Prayer brings healing. That's why we pray together as a church for the healing of so many people that we know are suffering. Prayer makes all the difference. This is why we lift people up to the Lord who are sick or who are injured or who are having surgery. We spend a lot of time doing that, don't we? But that's because we are turning to the one who provides the healing in whatever way that he chooses to do that. It's the same thing when we ask God to save us from our sins. It's that simple prayer of confession and repentance that brings us life. Now, sometimes we make it sound like 
you have to follow a certain list of requirements and this is how you get saved. You know, you have to confess your sins, you have to ask Jesus into your life, you have to ask for forgiveness. Yeah, those are all necessary things to do. But we are saved, we're healed from our sins just by our dependence on God's power to do it. Just as Jesus depended on God's power to heal sickness. Our salvation is an act of God. We must depend totally on him to perform that work in us. And so that's why prayer is not just an obligation of the Christian. It is what puts us in touch with the very healing power of God. Our prayer life as Christians holds the key to connecting with that power. Just as we can see from Jesus' life. The essence of our relationship with God is what brings healing and wholeness to our lives. And that is our total dependence on him and his power. His ability to do it. We see this in Jesus' healing of the sick. And in those cases where God chooses not to heal the sick, which he certainly does sometimes, he just says no to our prayers. Sometimes Jesus didn't heal everyone who was there. That does not need to affect our faith in him because we know all the time that we are depending on him and his power to do what he chooses to do. There are several other factors that are common in Jesus' healing of the sick which also apply to our salvation experience. For instance, when Jesus would heal someone, often he would make reference to the faith of that person who was healed. The fact that the sick person believed with all his heart and soul that Jesus was the only one capable of healing him or her was a crucial ingredient of that healing. Jesus would say like he did in Luke 17, 19, your faith has made you well. Or as in 1842, it's because of your faith that you've been healed. And I'm convinced that this is because God wants us to know that faith is the one and only requirement on our part for the sickness of our soul and to be forgiven of our sins. Now, by that word faith, I'm not just talking about believing something or acknowledging something, but I'm talking about having total trust in Jesus, being able to approach him and say, I believe you are the only one who is capable of taking away my sin, and I'm going to trust you with my life. That is saving faith. And that's a part of our salvation, our spiritual healing. There's one difference at this point between physical and spiritual healing. As I said, not everyone who is physically ill is healed from their sickness, even if they do have total faith in God. There are many examples in Scripture of godly people who have not been healed of a sickness or an affliction, such as Elisha or Timothy, another companion of Paul's named Trophimus, as well as Paul himself. He prayed to be released from his thorn in the flesh and the answer was no. Perhaps you know of someone who was sick and you've prayed and you've prayed and they didn't get any better or they're not getting any better. Well we said that as long as there is sin in the world there will continue to be sickness but that doesn't mean that God is powerless to do anything about it. It just means that at times he chooses to manifest his power not by curing the sickness but by working in the midst of the sickness by using the sickness, by using the weakness or the affliction to complete his will. Many different possible explanations for how he does that. That could be a sermon for another time, but just important to know that, that there's a reason for what God does. But my point here that I want to make is that spiritually, everybody, all who place their faith in Jesus Christ will be healed. That is a promise. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God's grace ensures that. And his grace is sufficient. And if you have experienced that healing, of being healed from the sickness of your sin, then you can know that there is coming a day when you will experience every kind of healing. Another beautiful thing about the way that Jesus healed the sick was that his purpose was not just to cure the sickness and to make people well, but it was to work to produce that kind of faith in their lives so that they would have that faith that says, I believe you can heal me. If all they wanted to do was cure the sickness, then he'd just have to speak and it would be done, like he did in the case of the centurion. He just said the word, go, and your servant is healed. That's all he needed to ever do. He could just walk around and say, your sins are, are you're, you're cured, you're cured, your sickness is gone, you're, you're all better now. But rather, he performed many of his healings in different ways, with, with different people. With some people, he would place his hand on the part of the body that, that needed healed. One blind man was led out of town before he was healed. With another, Jesus applied his saliva to his eyes. Others had their body anointed, or they were sent to a distant pool to, to be healed. Others were simply told to get up and walk, 
with nothing else needing to be done. In each of these cases, Jesus was teaching them not only to have faith, but to exercise their faith. And he worked differently with each person to produce and to develop that faith. It is our faith in Jesus that sets us free from the hopelessness of our sin and our fear and our doubt. And God wants to produce and to develop that faith in us as well. Because after all, if he wanted to, all he would have to do was say, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, everybody's forgiven, and that's it. He could actually do that because he alone has the power to do that. But rather, he works with each one of us in different ways. He may bless you in a way that he doesn't bless me. He may test your faith in a way that he doesn't test mine. That's because he wants each of us to walk personally with him, not just be able to quote a few Bible verses and go to church on Sunday and call ourselves Christians. I think it's wonderful that God cares about each of us as individuals and that he wants to work to produce a growing faith in each of us. There's only one way to be saved, and that's by the grace and the power of God alone. But there's lots of ways to have our faith produced and developed and grown. And God knows the best way for us to experience that healing touch. Now, in some instances, Christ sought out the cooperation of others in the work of healing. He uses the people that, that were close to the sick person as agents of his power. Lots of examples of this. There was a story of the Syrophoenician's daughter, or the nobleman's son, or an epileptic boy, or, or the story of the centurion's servant, where God utilized the faith of a parent or of a friend to bring healing. He involves those who cared for and, and loved the sick person. So the prayers of people in behalf of others are an important process, uh, are an important part of God's process of healing. And I know you all believe that. And that's why we concentrate so much on praying for those who are sick. Many of, of people that a lot of us don't even know, but you have confidence to bring those prayers to God's people because of, of your faith in, in what the power of prayer can do. God uses us and our faith in Him as we pray for one another. And I also firmly believe that God seeks out the cooperation in the spiritual healing of those who are lost in their sins. He requires that the family and friends of those who don't even know the Lord to pray and to witness. And he uses us to bring salvation to those that we care so deeply about. Now, yes, each person is responsible for his or her own decision. But if there is someone in your life who doesn't know God, don't you think God wants to use you as an agent of his healing? Be sure that you're faithful to your responsibility to those in your life who need spiritual healing. Just as you are towards those who need physical healing. If people that you know are sick, don't you pray for them? Don't you ask us to pray for them? If they're lost in their sins, do you pray for them? Will you ask us to pray for them? We'll do that. God is depending on our cooperation, and you can make a difference in this whole healing process. Two more observations about Christ's healing power. Now, in several instances of healing, the miracle was not complete at once. It started instantaneously at Christ's command, but the entire healing was a process which took place over time. One boy was set free from a fever, but the Bible says that from that time began to mend. Uh, the Syrophoenician's daughter that I talked about was delivered from a demon, but she was found prostrate on her bed requiring rest and care. Uh, the daughter of Jairus was also ordered rest and food. A blind man at Bethsaida was restored to perfect sight, but it was in degrees. He saw a little bit at first and then more later. That gives us encouragement as we think about Matt and what he's going through. Now, when you think about it, this is how God heals most of the time. And he still does it today, by a natural process, through the healing powers that he created within the human body. And believe me, that process is every bit of a miracle as any instantaneous healing. The fact that he made our body so that even though we're sick, we will feel better soon. Well, our spiritual healing also began at the touch of the master's hand. He came into our life and when we reached out in faith to him and asked for forgiveness, we were born again. But often the consequences of our sins, of our sins still remain, even though we've been cured from it. The total Healing is a process that takes place over time. As we are fed by the Lord, as we gain strength in our faith and our trust in Him, as we learn to walk in the Spirit more and more day by day, 
then we are in that process of being healed spiritually. And when God works in our life that way, it is just as much of a miracle as those dramatic turnaround stories that we hear of people that were drug addicts or prostitutes and come to the Lord. We love those stories and those are great and wonderful, but still the healing power of God is at work in each one of us as he produces that faith in us. And we go through that process of being made whole. It's still a miracle to be renewed in mind and in spirit day by day. And then one more thing about Jesus' healing touch is that it is indiscriminate. It went out to every sort of person imaginable, to Jews and to Gentiles, to people that were very close to Jesus and to people that he had never met, to prominent members of society and to people that were totally unknown, to the rich and to the poor, to the respected and the rejected of society. Anyone could be healed. It may seem like it was just the lowly, downtrodden, especially sinful people who got preferential treatment from Jesus, but I believe that we might hear more about those kind of people because they were the first ones to turn to Jesus for help. They were the ones who knew that they truly needed him. Well, the same way spiritually, Jesus' power to heal sin goes out freely and indiscriminately, not just to good family people who give to charities and whose kids get good grades and visit their grandmothers, but also to the people on welfare, people who live in the gutters, people who are dirty and who lack social graces. Our trust in him is the only requirement to receive his healing. Perhaps we might hear more about those drug addict stories and alcoholics and gang members who become Christians because they're, they're more dramatic. And maybe they're the ones who first realize how much they need to be healed and how much they need God. But we all need him. We're all sick because of our sin. We all need healing. And Jesus offered the only way to be healed when he offered himself on the cross. So I need to ask you today, have you accepted that offer? Have you been healed of your sin? We learn about the Jesus who heals sickness. He has the power to do that. Do you know the Jesus who can heal your sin and make you whole, produce a faith in you that will last forever?